We've seen your comments itching for Season 4 content, and boy are we going to give it to you. Just a small problem, the uh, tuning on the PTR right now is an absolute mess. Like, here's a, a log of a trinket doing 12% of a mage's overall damage. That's probably getting fixed. Um, but there's a lot of this sort of thing, like just stuff that makes it impossible to make any like objective, you know, tier lists as to what the meta is going to look like. I can't say with any certainty if your spec is going to thrive in Season 4, but a question that I can answer is, if my spec were a stock, would you invest in it? So that is what we're going to do today. Welcome to Skill Capped Investments. We're going to find all the, the hottest tips and advice on what classes to invest in for Season 4 of Dragonfly. The views expressed here are those of individual choice and not the views of Skill Capped Investments, LLC, or its affiliates. Class training can occur any time between the production of this content and your viewing. Subscribe to Skill for latest updates and But before you can make any specific investments, you need to understand the, 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 the broader you know, market trends and what's really going on in the world of Warcraft. Season 4 is weird. Blizzard brought back previous tier sets based on a community poll, so players naturally gravitated towards their most powerful tier set. That means every class is going to be getting more powerful in Season 4. Well, almost everyone. 40% of specs voted for are returning tier sets, so that's where we're going to see the majority of notable changes. Another key factor to consider before investing are the dungeons themselves. As we spoke about last week, uh, older dungeons tend to have less going on mechanically, and a lot of those older dungeons that we've seen recently have had, you know, smaller pool counts, things that put downward pressure on big pools. It's very annoying to do a big pool in Vortex Pinnacle, for example, versus any other key ever. Trash pools in Season 3 gravitated towards smaller pools that involved, like, you're locking down water bolt casts and things. Season 4 is going to see the return of big pools with more emphasis put on swirlies and frontals and spinny boys. What that means is that stocks in melee are likely to go way down as uptime is going to be affected on that front. And, uh, you know, uh, ranged DPS is going to have maybe a harder time with positioning, but stocks in good cast is way up because they actually know what they're doing. So, let's start with tanks because the entire tank meta can be very succinctly summarized in one question. Is Vengeance going anywhere? To answer that, I have here a list of every change made to Vengeance in Season 4. Um, it's a blank page. But that's okay, because I have here a list of all the changes made to other tanks in Season 4. It's also blank. It's the same page. They're changing nothing. So Vengeance is going to remain, like, the defining tank in the meta so far. Um, now granted, like, investing in Vengeance is a bit like investing in Facebook. Like, yeah, like, they've been doing really well for the last couple of, of, of cycles now. But surely they're about to crash. And to which I say, like... Vengeance is so fundamentally strong right now that I think it can absorb like all traditional nerfs. I really don't think that it's going to go away unless Blizzard actively assassinates it. So investments in Vengeance, very sound. But let's say that you're into alternative investments. What else is out there? Well, Guardian Druid is the obvious second pick. Uh, they're probably the only tank that can really match Vengeance in terms of its survivability. The downside is that while they can pull as big as Vengeance, they can't lock it down as well as Vengeance can. So that puts a lot more onus on the group itself to uh, make up with that slack. For that reason, we expect Guardian to improve in Season 4, but ultimately get lost in the noise alongside all the other tanks. The rest of the tanks are serviceable, but there's very little justification to bring one over a Vengeance Demon Hunter. Warriors might do some interesting things with Spell Reflect. That's the kind of fringe stuff we're expecting. Listen, this is the free market. If you want to YOLO your net worth on Brewmaster Monk, that is your titan-given right, and I respect it. I, I wish you nothing but success. But if you're going to invest in, in risky, volatile specs, you need to be informed. These DPS specs are the penny stocks of Season 4. These are specs that underperformed in Season 3, and we have no reason to expect that anything's going to change. Um, and these are all for very boring reasons that you're familiar with, you know, Hunters take too much damage, Elemental Shaman's target cap's too low, Warriors don't bring enough utility, it's all boring stuff for the most part. But, you know, just like Penny Stocks, a few of you guys are going to invest in it anyway, it's going to go poorly and you're going to get really mad at me about it. Leave me alone. But enough about who isn't changing, let's talk about the one spec that is seeing real change in Season 4, Holy Priest. Holy Priest got a pretty pretty decent overhaul in uh, Season 4, but the changes can best be surmised as quality of life stuff. Uh, most reports are that the spec is a lot more fun to play now, and its damage is, is cranked right now. Um, it's very impressive, and we think that's going to spark a lot of initial curiosity. So I'm I'd be willing to invest in Holy Priest, but mainly in the form of like, zero day options, which is to say, um, short term stuff, not expecting it to really hold. Because ultimately, Holy's like fundamental flaw hasn't really been fixed which is that Discipline Priests exist. Holy Priest mains will enjoy the changes, and you know, like they'll, they'll see a bump in their performance, but ultimately this is a windfall for existing shareholders and not really an incentive for new buyers. So on that subject then, Disc Priests. Discipline was the smallest of the big three last season, but they remain a, a very, very strong healer, and they are, on their own merits, a very solid investment. 
but you should be aware that uh, discipline does face an, an existential crisis right now. Not, not from without, this isn't Resto Druids or Mistweaver Monks, but from within. Shadow Priests. Shadow Priests are almost certain to own in Season 4, but it's worth noting that it won't be for, for precisely the same reason as those previous seasons. Um, a lot of the utility that was so good in God Comp, you know, the MD and PI, that stuff's re received uh, a bit of a nerf. Um, and at the same time, they're returning to their Season 2 tier set, which while it's, it is their favourite set, um, the Season 3 playstyle was very forgiving movement-wise. It allowed them to do their main burst rotation entirely instantly. Um, so we're expecting that quite a few LFG guys are going to get punished by, by that. They're going to be exposed. Um, so that's fun. If you have any, any Fodum uh, Shadow Priest friends, maybe divest of them real quick. One little wrinkle with Shadow is that it's been propped up in these last two seasons by the value and synergy of, of PI with Fire Mage. And um, I've, I've got bad news. Skill capped exclusive Fire Mage not doing very good on the PTR right now. Hey, editing choice here. I just wanted to add some better context to this claim because I don't want to give you the wrong impression. To illustrate the state of Fire Mage, let's look at a pull from the PTR with Stover, who consulted on this episode. Stover pops Combust 5 seconds into the pull. This is where a normie would expect him to start popping off, but it takes him an extra 15 seconds to overtake the tank on the damage meter. But as the combat continues, Stover slowly gains ground on the other DPS, and when the combat ends at the 85 second mark, he is at the top of the damage meter. For the Mage, this feels bad. It's not a good damage profile, but it's workable in high keys. When you consider how absurdly overpowered Fire's utility is, it's very likely that the spec will muscle its way into high keys. In low keys, where the pull ends here, Fire ends up looking very bad. It's an example of how different class balance can look at different tiers of content. Some people might ask, like, is this an opportunity for, for Arcane or Frost? Quarter Eyes really is that strong. Like, it's just, I don't, I don't think Arcane and Frost are going to really, like, do much in the meta. Um, this is a common issue with, with DPS balancing. Often like one or two bits of utility can just completely shut down certain specs. And another key example of that is going to be Destro Warlock. You know, Destro Warlock is going to render Affliction and Demo obsolete in Season 4. For real though, you aren't prepared for how much Destro is going to pop off in Season 4. You think you know. You watch MDR and you're like, oh wow, Destro is going to pop off in Season 4. No bro, they're getting a new tier set. Their single target's going to cop a bit of a hit, but their AoE might just be the highest in the game. And then you compare that with all their usual utility, you know, you've got your health stones, your gateway skips, and all that sort of stuff. And they're, and they're indestructible for some reason, I forgot about that, they're just, they're, they're immune to death, that's a, that's a good benefit. But then you have the Imp. Season 4 has a lot of magic dispels and things to worry about, and MD being nerfed means that there's a bit of a, a hole that Destro can potentially fill, because that Imp dispel can substitute for the MD in, in a lot of good ways. They're just so damn powerful, and, and they're gonna get nerfed. But like Vengeance, I'm looking at it and it's like, you can nerf that by what, 30% they'll be fine, they'll, they'll be fine, like, it's, they'll, they'll be fine. Invest in Destro Locks. And then there's Moonkins who, uh, so, so for Dragonflight's launch, Blizzard increased the cost of Star Surge for, for a bit, and it killed the spec's whole vibe. The spec was temporarily mended with a free proc of Star Surge from their, their tier set bonus. Um, but in patch 10.1, the vibe got fixed, and the tier set was immediately nerfed to, to compensate. Moonkins, bless them, just assumed that they'd get the original version of their tier set. Like, they opened up the poll, they read the text, they comprehended what they were looking at, and then Pikachu faced when that was the tier set that they got. And like, if, if that's not, if that doesn't surmise the Moonkin experience, I don't know what does, man. It's such, it is classic Moonkin behaviour. Uh, so that tier set, despite being buffed on PTR, still seems to suck so hard that it has griefed the entire spec. But look, I'm playing this up for effect. Moonkin's gonna be fine, it's just... This wouldn't happen with, with any other spec, man. But enough Moonkin talk, they, they enjoy the attention too much. Let's, let's talk about Evokers. If I had to bet my life on one class being ubiquitous next season, it would be Evoker. You're gonna want them in every key, invest in them. And when I say Evoker, I didn't, I didn't mispronounce Augment. All three specs are going to be real. The, the Evoke Legendary weapon, just to start, is getting juiced in Season 4, so that's back in play and it's just a, a huge buff for the class as a, as a whole. And it's worth remembering that while Augment undeniably brings the most utility, a lot of the strengths of Augment are sort of baseline Evoker talents. Augmentation's value in Season 4 is going to be very similar to Season 3, where they're going to be a net DPS loss to bring, but bring a lot of very valuable defensive utility. That means that Org's popularity will depend on how survivability ends up playing out. If the incoming damage scales out of control, then Org will be mandatory. If not, they may be considered, you know, dead weight. 
Devastation has been all over the PTR in Season 4. It's looking like this is going to be its moment. Um, not for any complicated reason, they just do unhinged amounts of single target damage. And like, combine that with their, like, the legendary and all the utility we mentioned, and it's just... They're looking really, 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 they're looking really good, bro. This one scary thing is, is the very well-documented threat issues. Um, that's very scary to consider when pairing it with Vengeance's own threat issues, but hey, there's, there's always an outplay angle, boys. Finally, Preservation of Ochre. Uh, we spoke earlier about how open the healing meta was in Season 3, and I think it's fair to say that Preservation will, at minimum, be looking to break into that top three but there's a real chance that it'll make a play at being number one healer again like we saw in Season 1. Preservation is, is perfectly equipped for dealing with Dragonflight's uh, healing demands. You know, they're very good at the, at the burst damage, that's what they're built to do. Their, their weakness is the rot-based healing, but the Season 1 tier set that they're getting back is, is built for rot-based healing. That solves their major weakness, healing profile-wise. Um, so when you combine that with the baseline evoke stuff, as one consultant put it, the question isn't why should you bring a preservation, it's why shouldn't you bring a preservation evoker. And, and there are reasons why you shouldn't, right? Like maybe augmentation ends up being mandatory, like we mentioned. Um, we also know famously that preservation struggles with its 25 yard healing range. Um, they may not want to be able to deal with, you know, pugs or mixed DPS groups with melee and ranged. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about here. And in that case, you're going to see your preservation get get uh, replaced by something else. Probably a Resto Druid. Resto Druids were the second of the big three last season, and, and they were exceptional. That shouldn't change in Season 4. Um, Resto Druids can handle Dragonflight's healing profile just fine, although it, 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 notably it isn't easy for them. Um, many Resto Druids that you meet in high keys have developed at least some form of anxiety disorder from the experience. Uh, that... <laughs> That makes them hard to recommend, but if you already have stock in Resto Druid, I think you're fine. Um, but if you're a prospective buyer, maybe shop around for something a little bit more accessible. Like Mistweaver Monk. Mistweaver was the most successful of the big three healers last season. Mistweaver has never truly shined in M Plus before, but they really feel like they belong. Mistweavers bring three different stops and an interrupt. This gives them insane carry potential. They've also become a very approachable healer to play, especially with the new quality of life changes the Spectres received in this patch. Basically, Mistweaver is a really strong option for someone looking for a spec that's simply plug and play. Oh sh**, Holy Paladin, yeah, uh, th there's no market for Holy Paladins. Um, no one wants to play them right now, no one wants to play with them. S sort of bums me out, really. Screw it, hear me out. Resto Shaman is going to crank in Season 4. For a year and a half now, Blizzard has been trying to satisfy complex criticisms of the spec by simply turning a big dial labelled healing. It's at the point now where Resto Shaman may have the highest raw healing throughput of any healer. They just can't translate it to success in keys. Our consultants reckon that the chain heal build may be a viable answer to the meta's burst damage, and Resto is going to scale outrageously with the returning tier 1 tier set. Now, is there an argument to bring a Resto Shaman over one of the meta healers we've covered? Here's a better question. Don't you deserve happiness? Just this once. I lost the audio for the last third of the video. I don't want to talk about it. We're doing it like a regular video now. Let's talk about the melee. The Havoc Demon Hunter. There's always too damn many Havocs floating around, but at least there was demand for the spec in Season 3. They spent most of the season as one of the top DPS specs, but between nerfs and the rising popularity of Vengeance, Havoc has slowly worked its way down the tier list. We don't see any reason for them to do poorly next season, but also we don't think they're going to be a particularly desirable meta class. So at this point, we ought to be bullying some of these guys into playing something else, like a Rep Paladin for instance. Stocks and Rhett have been climbing for months now. Retribution's success in Season 3 can be attributed to the Frag Weapon, which of course is sticking around. Their damage is awesome and pairs with the classic Paladin utility, strong defensives, and notably for melee, uncapped AoE. For all of these reasons and more, we reckon that if any melee is going to thrive in Season 4, it's going to be Rep Paladin. Easy invest. Outlaw was the other dominant melee in Season 3, and they look great on PTR. However, there was lots of little niggles, I guess you'd call them, that look set to compound. Obviously, there's the 8 target cap. That's not ideal, but also not a deal breaker. But what's really piqued our interest is Outlaw's stat scaling. In Season 4, we're expecting to soft cap all our secondary stats. A spec like Frost DK, who values all four of their secondaries equally, they can spread it around and avoid diminishing returns. They're going to scale really well. By contrast, Outlaw only cares about two of the four secondary stats. So it's either eat the DR or invest in garbage. In both cases, they won't be benefiting from gear as much as the other DPS. I should be clear that we aren't cold on Outlaw. It's a very solid investment. We think they're going to do well. We're just expecting the dominance of Outlaw to decline by some unknown amount. The spec will remain exceptionally powerful and well equipped for keys, but if things get really weird, there's always Sub Rogue. While Outlaw has one of the most consistent damage profiles in the game, Sub is one of the most bursty. The AoE is uncapped, which is a huge check right there, 
and they have the capability to either burst for pure AoE or priority single target. It's easy to forget this, but like sub was all over the place in the Midrasil. It was it was a really powerful spec. We don't talk about it in keys much, but like sub is a real thing. If Outlaw's scaling issues are real, there's a genuine possibility that we'll see sub emerge as the dominant rogue spec. Is that likely? I don't know, but like screw it, I'd invest. I love Enhance, I really do, and it's almost really good, and in early Season 3 we saw Enhance find some success, but they slowly disappeared as the season went on because ultimately they're just kind of a squishier version of Outlaw Rogue with a worse target cap. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I would not invest. I want to talk about Death Knights. Unholy will basically be the same, it's good but not great. If you're holding stock in Unholy, I think you're fine to hold it. Honestly though, the spec I'm more excited to see is Frost DK. We saw murmurs on the PTR that the Frost spec may explode in Season 4, that makes sense given that we just spoke about how well the Obliteration build is going to scale with gear. Combine that with a frack weapon in the Season 2 tier set, and Frost is, at minimum, going to be pretty good. But then you start fantasizing about Breath of Sinister Ghost from some of these pulls, and like, man, if there was ever a time for the Breath build to pop off in M+, surely it would be this, right? Look, I'm a Windwalker guy, so I don't want to overhype this necessarily, but we are so fucking back, man. Like, Season 1, obviously Windwalker's very good, Season 2, yeah, and Season 3, they were just non-existent. We're getting our Season 1 tier set back, so it stands to reason, we are so fucking back. Um, you combine that with good stat scaling, and we're seeing Windwalker do pretty well in the PTR right now. And, you know, like, we've been talking about, like, the wizard meta this whole time, talking up the, the value of Shadow Priest and Destro Warlocks. Like, melee is still going to exist, right? And, like, look at this comp. Don't you just want to stop what you're doing and go queue this comp? Tell me this comp isn't going to do well. It's amazing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go queue it up right now. Um, if Windwalker's going to do well in this next season, it's going to be in this sort of melee comp that really makes the most of his Mystic Touch ability. I'm, I'm investing. But that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much for watching. What did you make of the, uh, the style there? Was it fun? Was it stupid? I'm really sad the audio got stuffed up, but it was just a bit of fun, so we'll, I'll, I'll get over it. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. I learned recently how important that really is. Um, also, please check out skillcap.com. You know, we've got the new season coming up, so there's going to be a lot of content about to hit the website. Um, combine that with, you know, the money-back guarantee and the VOD reviews, and really there's... There's no better time to give the, the service a shot. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week.